I don't have a whole lot of people here. Goodness. Kira thought you were going to do a recording of it and send it to everyone. Yeah, I am recording it right now. Um, so today is Friday. Today, what we have is um, a hot read for the first summer. Um, for the summer, I should say. Um, so today I'm having it be a requirement, but after today it is optional if you want to listen to them or not. Um, just to kind of get you guys um, interested in some books to read. Um, but I'm not going to do any like forcing of you guys to listen to it if you don't want to after today. Um, after that, we have um, your vocab test today. Um, you are just going to silent read without any conferring entry. And then um, you are going to be doing a life journal prompt. Okay. Um, so if you don't have an idea as to what life journal prompt you want or what to write about, I do give you a couple options um, in the direction. So with that, I'm going to get started. Um, present my screen. So I'm going to be using the Sora app, and all you guys do to log into Sora is typing in your student ID number. It's not your username. It's not your password. Um, it is your student ID number, what you would type in normally at the library. So um, today I am choosing a book specifically that I think everyone would maybe enjoy. It's a little bit of like a thriller. I have not read it yet, but this is a book I would want to read. Um, so here is a little synopsis of it. Um, so this is called Ransom. Um, and it says, Valley Gardens is the last stop on the bus route after school. The neighborhood is known for its wealthy families, perhaps the richest in town. Marianne, Bruce, Glenn, Dexter, and Jesse live in a va live in Valley Gardens and have no trouble guiding the new bus driver to the last stop of the day. But the strange substitute driver keeps driving. Soon the five teenagers are hostages deep in the mountains. Their kidnappers demand sacks of money, sacks of money. Whoever has their mic on, I'm going to ask you to turn it off, please. Um, stacks of money from their families, even though most of the students aren't as well off as the, as the abduct, abductors assume. Without hope of raising the ransom money, the five teens must find a way out or face terrifying consequences. So I opened up the sample. So one of the nice features is you guys can ask for a sample. Um, and I'm going to just read a little bit of the sample. All right, so chapter one. The kidnapping took place on a Thursday. If it had been a Friday, Jesse said afterward, I wouldn't have taken the bus at all. I would have stayed in the library and read until Mother picked me up after her committee meeting. There is a lot of a lot of ifs. If my car had not been in the garage, said Glenn, so these must have been old enough teens um, that they could have, or some of them could have drove, it sounds like. And Marianne Paget thought, if I had taken that ride with Rod when he offered it to me, when he drove all the way over to the high school just to pick me up, but she had not. She had climbed onto the bus with others, holding her slim shoulders defiantly straight beneath the blue suede jacket. I have hurt him, she thought, and the, acknowledge, and the knowledge was strangely satisfying. I have hurt him, and by hurting him, I have shown mother and all of them. When she took her seat, she leaned forward and looked out the window to where Rod was standing beside his car, staring in a defeated way at the door as she entered, as she just entered. 
What can she see in him? Marianne asked herself bitterly. He is so dull and his hair is going and his hair is going. It won't be long now before he is completely bald. Imagine mother having a bald husband. How can she like him? How can she even stand him after living with daddy? So it sounds like Rod is like a stepdad that she doesn't like. So that's why she is kind of hurt by the whole situation. The man by the car was standing there, still watching the bus door, as though half hoping that she might change her mind and get off again. You would think he would begin to realize, thought Marianne, but no, he will go home and tell mother, and he will just and he will be just as hurt and surprised as though it were the as though it were the first time. And mother will say, Give it time, dear. It's just a phase. She hasn't adjusted yet. It will be it will be all right in time. But it will be one more thing, one more wedge between the two of them. And it will not be long before they will have to know that time will make no difference. Time will not change a thing. So it sounds like that's Marianne's plan is to keep this up in hopes that they will no longer be together. The bus filled quickly. From her seat next her from her seat near the back, Jessie French watched the other students pouring in, laughing, shoving, tossing their books about. They crowded into the double seats, and Jessie, sitting alone, felt the empty space beside her, beside her becoming more and more obvious as it was ignored by first one person and then another. There was a moment when she thought Glenn Kirtland was going to sit there. He seemed to hesitate for an instant, and then his eyes went ahead and he moved forward and took the seat next to Marianne. I should have known, Jesse thought, that he would sit there or would, wouldn't sit here and she let herself relax again, not certain whether the sudden crave, crave, I'm sorry, cavid, cavid feeling was relief or disappointment. If he had sat next to her, she would have had to talk to him. And what would, and what could one say to a boy like Glenn, the president of the student body and captain of the football team? Jesse, who could speak speak to adults with ease and graciousness, who could discuss art and history and politics with Frenchmen and Germans and Italians in their native tongues, found herself weak and tongue-tied at, th at the idea of talking school and sports with Glenn Kirtland. If he weren't so popular, she thought, because of course that was only an excuse, for popular people were popular because they were easy to talk to. There was Marianne now, chatting away to him already, already turning in her seat to face him, letting her soft blonde hair fall across her cheek. But then Marianne was popular too. She was pretty and pert and bubbly and had undoubtedly never had a moment's, moment's self-consciousness in her life. May I sit here? Jesse glanced up and nodded and, and nodded, and Bruce Kirtland took the seat that his brother had not occupied. Bruce was only a freshman, a thin boy with glasses and nervous, over-eager puppy dog look. He sat down too quickly, and, sev and several of his books tumbled onto the floor. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. There goes another. You know me. Here, let me hold those others. You're going to lose them too. Jessie reached over and studied the remaining two books, wondering as she did so how someone like Glenn could possibly have a brother as awkward as Bruce. At the same time, she felt a wave of sympathy for this boy, who could have, who would have to live always in the shadow of Glenn. Do you have them? She asked kindly as he bobbled up from the floor, his face flushed with exertion. Yes, 
I think so. I'm sorry. That's all right. She had her own books piled neatly on her lap. Math, which she detested, and chemistry, and a French novel, which she was reading for pleasure. Normally, she would have opened it the moment she was settled, but now, because it was Bruce next to her, and because he was so obviously embarrassed about his clumsiness, she felt duty-bound to make at least a few minutes of conversation. It's really turning cold, she said. Yes, it is, Bruce leaned across her to gaze out the window. It looks kind of like snow, doesn't it? It's coming late this year. His voice is hopeful. If Glenn gets his car out of the shop this afternoon, he may be able to go up to the up to Teos. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure they just made a boo-boo here. If you guys can see this, we've got Jesse talking, and then right within the same line, Bruce is responding. So we learned before this whole stay-at-home order that this should be its own paragraph. To ski, Jesse asked politely. That should be fun. Do you think of, do you like skiing? I like it fine, but I haven't gone too many times. Glenn usually, Glenn's usually got a bunch of his friends going. Boy, he's good. My brother, you ought to see him come down snake, come down snake dance. He sat back in his seat, and Jesse, nodding, realized that her sympathy had been misplaced. There was no jealousy here, only a glow of pride in his brother's accomplishments. Glenn, Glenn can even take jumps. You know the ski pros at Teos? He says Glenn is one of the best skiers who comes up there. He paused and polite, then added politely, Do you ski? And Jesse answered, oh, they did it again. I haven't skied here in New Mexico. We've been only we've been here only since summer. They did it again, guys. They did it again. Someone needs to go through and fix fix their punctuation. You'll learn, Bruce told her consolingly. There are lots of beginners. And Jessie, who had been about to add the fact that the last time she had skied and had been in the Swiss Alps, left the words unspoken and smiled at him instead. I'm sure I'll like it, she said. Dexter Barton was the last one to get on the bus. His sixth period was gym class, and it always made him late because he didn't like using the community showers. He hung around the gym, bouncing balls and putting away the exercise mats until the first rush was over, and then went into the dressing room just as most of the other guys were leaving. If he was lucky and the shower was empty, he used it. Otherwise, he yanked down his clo yanked his clothes on as quickly as possible, trusting trusting to the general rush and confusion of late dressing to cover the omission of bathing. By the time he was clothed and had put away his gym clothes, it was a matter of luck whether or not he was able to make the bus before it, before it pulled out of the lot. Sometimes he didn't, and it, and it meant hitchhiking, something he did not particularly mind when the weather was warm. Today, however, the wind, was, the wind had a nasty nip to it, and the idea of hit of his standing for half an hour on a street corner, thumbing a ride, was a far from a ple was a far from ple pleasant one. He put on a final burst of speed and jogged up to the bus just as the door was closing. He grabbed it with his good left hand, so something must be wrong with his right, and yanked it open and clambered up the steps, glancing about for him for a seat. The only one left was near the back by a window, and he had to climb over a giggly sophomore girl to reach it. You might at least say, excuse me, she told him coyly, and her counterpart in the seat directly across the aisle giggled also. Excuse me, Dexter said. Think nothing of it, I'm sure. Her mock New York accent was a pleasant duplication of his own, and she fluttered her eyelashes at him flirtatiously. You won't by chance be from the East, would you? Yes. 
Dexter said co coldly, not rising to the bait. He wedged himself on into the corner and turned his face to the window. Not so much to see out. Not so much to see out to avoid contact with the seatmate. The bus had ground had ground into motion now, moving out of the school driveway slowly, slowly turning into the street. It lurched a little and swung wide to avoid the drive slowly school zone sign, which marked the middle lane or middle line, and it seemed to straighten with an effort. To Dexter, who had always who was always conscious of mechanics, it was immediately apparent that something was not as usual. He turned his gaze from the window and straightened in his seat, trying to see the front. Glenn Rutland's head blocked him, and he pulled himself higher. What are you looking at? asked the girl next to him. The driver, Dexter told her shortly. Is something the matter with him? He's different. He's not the guy who usually drives us. Oh, I hadn't noticed. Now she too rose, leaning out into the aisle to gain a better view. You're right. He is different. He's totally cute. Look at those shoulders. Ignoring the comment, Dexter sat back into his seat. I wonder if he's going to be our regular driver from now on, or if he's just a substitute. The girl looked at Dexter inquiringly, as though he thought I as though he thought I should know the answer, as though I give mm -hmm, whether the guy is a guy with the shoulders was going to drive every day or not. When she received no answer, she flushed a little and looked ahead again. He is cute, she murmured, and her friend across the aisle giggled in agreement. Those shoulders, all that red hair, a positive movie star worth riding the bus, the old bus for. <sighs> Idiot girls, thought Dexter. The old familiar hurt was, was in him. The aching, sick feeling, which had been there for so long now that it was almost a part of him. He should have grown used to it by this time. And yet something like this, a dun dumb comment about a couple of flutter-headed females, could bring it up sharp against his insides with a jab, which was almost physical in its intensity. Those shoulders. He scowled out the window, forcing his eyes to the mountains, half hidden in clouds to the bleak white sky stretched on above them. It was going to snow, he thought. He turned his thoughts to the snow, to the cold air against his face, and the feel of skis beneath his feet, to the perfect moment of the freedom as he stood at the top of a top of a run, gazing out over the long white slope that stretched before him, like a bird at the last crucial instant before taking flight. If I had only had a car, he thought, I would take the whole weekend skiing. I'd go up to the Santa Fe, maybe even to Teos. If Uncle Mark should fl fly to the coast, if I could get the keys to the Jaguar. Of course, that would not happen. It never did happen at the right times. This was when it would be would have been good to be a friend of Glenn Kirtland with his car with the ski rack on top, but no, it wouldn't be worth it. Dexter couldn't bring himself to be the hypocritical to be hypocritical enough to bootlick someone like Kirtland just for the sake of a ski weekend. So I'm thinking like bootlick is like bending down, kissing his boots, like trying to worship him in order to be friends with him. What's wrong with him? The girl across the aisle whispered, and Dexter's seatmate gave him a sideways glance and said, stuck up. She deliberately said it just loudly enough to carry, but he was scowling at the window, his dark brows drawn together and his eyes on the mountains. He didn't hear her. I'm going to stop there and close it. 
there's still quite a ways through. They give you about 30 pages, it looks like, but this book, if you are interested in it, um, it looks like the beginning part, they're just introducing the major characters, um, the five main ones, and uh, kind of telling us a little bit about each of them, probably so we can kind of figure out how they're going to use those personalities to escape from the mountain, especially since all of them seem to have very different ones. But this is Ransom. It's on Sora if you are interested. Um, Tomorrow, I will probably do a different one for you guys. Um, try and give you a couple different varieties. Um, or not tomorrow, tomorrow, Saturday, Tuesday. Um, but I've been going through and kind of trying to find as many different options as possible. Um, but I also don't want this to go too long for you guys either. So, other than that, um, don't forget to mark this as complete. Otherwise, next week, we'll continue doing hot reads. If you're interested, it is optional. Um, I'm, again, trying to find some fun series uh, for you guys to look into. But um, I hope you guys have a great day and get outside and enjoy the weather this weekend. Um, just a reminder, too, that Monday you guys have no school. So um, I hope you guys have a great Memorial Day weekend. Um, but let me end the recording.